So I guess, yeah, today's presentation ignores some of the formatting when it's been copied across. It has gone a bit squish, so that's not me being lazy. It's just it's kind of has gone to a Mac. It's gone a, bit, gone a bit strange. But I guess today, you know, just want to cover off what personalization is, how you can practically set up your GA for it, um, you know, examples of audiences that you can use, and I guess, you know, how you can power it. They're the kind of key things we're going to talk about today. I'm going to try and make this as fun as possible because analytics can be a very dry and incredibly boring subject. So... Um, yeah, I'll keep it as fun as possible, ask a few kind of questions uh, as we go along. So first three slides of creds, so sorry about that, kind of have to get that out of the way to prove I know what I'm talking about, I guess. So this is me, really cheesy, slightly stretched picture there, uh, look a bit thinner in real life probably, but um, so yeah, this is me, I've got nine years web analytics and um, optimization experience generally. I set up iProspects UK offering for analytics and conversion, and uh, we've got 70 guys who specialise in just analytics and making websites better. So it's quite a large scale operation working with some pretty big brands and I think the kind of really satisfying thing for us is that we're one of six agencies in the UK who are officially certified by Google to provide advice and configuration on GA and GA360. So something we're pretty proud of. So a um, handful of clients, we're big and small, this gives you a flavour of some of the kind of guys we work with, retail, gambling, you know, lead generation, etc. It's uh, pretty, pretty all encompassing. So that's the three slides, and that's it. No more creds. On to like the good stuff that you guys can take away and nick or copy or whatever, whatever we're all here for. So um, I guess I'd start by just talking about what personalization is or what, what I think it is. I think broadly, you know, using data to identify an individual at the point of interaction and deliver a relevant addressable message, essentially giving a customer what they want. So I'll talk about the individual in a little bit because I think people get very caught up in one-to-one -one marketing or we've got to have a one-to-one -one. and I think it's incredibly difficult or in fact impossible to do one-to-one -one personalization. You need to think about your customers very differently and I'll come and explain that in, in a second as well. But one thing that absolutely drives me bonkers is, isn't the format of the slide that also does drive me bonkers but um, people get too ahead of themselves with personalization. It's like hearing the word DMP. So many clients come to us and say we need a DMP or we need to do personalization, but they haven't even got a CRM system, they haven't even like settled their analytics properly, etc. So before you think about personalization in any context, these are three things you need to do. Well, there's four, because obviously the analytics part is coming up, but get your website loading as quickly as possible. Um, don't use Google Page Insights to you know, just tell you what's wrong with your site. There are many, many other tools out there, such as SpeedCurve, GT Metrics, etc., that are good for site speed optimization. A lot of clients we see buy a report from Google Insight from another agency and, and that kind of drives me nuts. But do MVC or AB testing, get your base level site as good as it can be before you start thinking about personalization. There's no point trying to personalize a website that it hasn't been tested to the nth degree already. And then lastly, do qualitative work, you know, do remote user research, do heat mapping, session replay, because all this stuff fuels a better baseline of a website. So that's kind of the kind of things you need to tick off. So hands up if you've done all of those and you're now ready for personalization. Oh, one guy, brave guy, brave guy, put up his hand. Okay, so personalization is important. You know, there's loads and loads of stats out there, but essentially what this is saying is that, you know, people who offer personalization to me, I come back more, I buy more, I'm engaged more, you know, and we see that a lot of people are frustrated when they don't get what they want from a website. So kind of these stats are from a consultancy and various reports that kind of uh, I've read or we've contributed towards. But it's not something new. So you obviously know these two websites. You probably all use these websites. These give you obviously relevant content broadly in terms of what you bought previously, what you're more likely to buy. A lot of this is powered by AI and multiple teams of hundreds and hundreds of people. And essentially we don't have them, you don't have them, you don't have you know 200 data scientists lying around to optimize by category like, like Amazon do. So kind of uh, today, I guess, it's about practical examples of how you can personalize your site without you know, employing a 200 strong data science team. So 100% robust data is key. 
again, it's something that clients just don't understand. They want to jump to the last thing. So um, I guess I'll ask a question now, which hopefully nobody will say yes to. But who here um, uses? Well, okay, you say yes. Who here uses GA at some point in a week? Okay, good. You're in the right room. Who who uses it every day? Okay, same number. And who here is confident in? It's data accuracy and that it's set up 100% with all the advanced functionality enabled. Well, wow. so again, that's, that's a totally normal response. I mean, it surprised me when I joined iProspects because I thought I'd go there and all these companies would be ready for like the advanced stuff. And you go in some major organizations, even big and small, and the, the shocking things you see in terms of the insight they're using, you know, in terms of hundreds of millions or tens of millions of digital marketing spend, and they're using GA that's, you know, double counting e-commerce. Trend. I mean, obviously, probably not as bad as that, but that's an example we've seen, a kind of well-known football club in the UK that shall remain nameless, was double counting sales online. So when they were looking at return on investment through GA, they were like, everything's great. And obviously, when they kind of looked at the bottom line, it was like, this doesn't really match. So kind of we're specialists in making sure the data is right. So I'm going to give you three practical things that we see wrong in every single account that we work with from a client point of view, and then I guess how to fix them. Now you don't have to scribble down the answer. People can have the slides afterwards or come and chat to me, but I guess it's how to find them and then how to fix it. And um, you know, I guess we have a 70-point configuration process and um, ranging from is my date right, you know, kind of really basic stuff, which we see wrong very, very often as well, which is also odd. Um, so... You know, we know there's kind of three bits to, to setting up GA to power personalization. So you've got make sure it's right, data hygiene stuff, which I'll talk about. Make sure it's advanced, you know, everything is being captured, that, that should be. And I guess how you think about activating that data. So from a, a robustness point of view, you know, we know it's important because it can distort overall performance of the website. It can distort where your problem pages are and it can lead to wasted investment and, and, and will do. So even if you get a, you know, a thousand fake sessions on a particular landing page, that distorts the performance massively and you might not choose to optimize it or you might do and, and obviously you might be starting in the wrong area. So these are the four common mistakes we see. So fake traffic and query parameters are the two big ones. Um, and I guess with the fake traffic, a lot of people think that when they've ticked that box which says, I don't want bots in my GA account, it's done. It, it's not. It's not done. Um, fake traffic changes all the time, you know, from your competitors monitoring your prices, you know, people trying to understand your site speed. These all trigger sessions and, and kind of activation in GA itself. So PI and hostname filters we'll kind of touch on briefly, but fake traffic and career parameters are the two that are kind of the most important. So fake traffic, right? So I don't know if you can all see this or not. Probably not. It's a little bit blurry, but essentially, if you click on the audience bit on the top left-hand side, you then click on network, and if you put a filter on this data saying, I want new sessions probably the greater than 95% and bounce rate greater than 95%, that will spit out a number which says, in a month, you've got X hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands or 1,000 fake sessions. And that number will not be zero. I guarantee it for all accounts. So this account here, you can see we obviously put that on. I don't know if you can see that or not, but essentially it's, it's capturing fake sessions in that account because they, from this exact service provider, they always entering new sessions. They always, um, you know, bounce on the site and they, they never have an e-commerce transaction and they're all predominantly from, you know, very, very similar cities a lot, a lot of the time. So if you put that on your account, I don't know if anyone's got a laptop open or GA account now because they can actually do that, but you will have a percentage of fake sessions. And sometimes it might only be 1%, sometimes it's 10%. And 10% of, you know, quite a large e-commerce website is quite a substantial proportion of sessions and can distort the overall numbers. So like I say, people on the slides afterwards, come, come grab me. Um, I, can, I can send them. Are we, Rob, we send these out afterwards? Or? Uh, can do as long as you're happy to, yeah. Yeah, fine. People can people have this one yeah. for free. So fixing it, kind of the, the, the kind of the good bit, I guess, why you guys are here. So yes, it's important to go into your view settings, click on please take out known bots. Um, but if you put a filter on there, which essentially filters out the ISP domain and goes back to what it says in these boxes here. So you can see, obviously, these guys here, one of those is Fast Host UK, which essentially is a site speed monitoring tool that one of their competitors was firing um, monitoring um, software, which triggered um, their JavaScript, which captures data in the account. So you just need to essentially exclude that, that from the account. Dead simple. So follow this process. Exclude bots, go in your filters, make a custom filter, exclude the, either the service provider or kind of the ISP uh, domain of fast hosts. So 
So obviously you can apply that to yours and once you've figured out what the name of the service provider is, you can then obviously go in and do that yourself. Does that all make sense to everybody? Like I said, I'm trying to keep this bit, I guess, practical. Some of this stuff is a bit more how do you activate personalization, but this is kind of how do I fix the kind of hygiene stuff. So another interesting one, which again, clients don't seem to understand, this might distort the data, is query parameters. Now this doesn't need any kind of development change. A lot of people think, oh, we need to go and beat IT over the head because they're terrible and they're making all these things wrong with the website. Essentially, query parameters are things that the website adds to, to make the page look different. So you'll see in this example here, each one of these is, is a slightly different campaign that someone's come in at, the page they've come through at, etc. But all these are pretty much exactly the same page. So obviously, they all go to the Play With 60 uh, late night landing page. And what happens is analytics records all of these individual pages. And obviously, when you look at your pages report, it could be in the hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, when in reality on your site, you might only have 100 pages. So essentially what you need to do is um, go to your site content, click on all pages, then put a, query, put a question mark in that box and it will tell you if you have query parameters or not. Dead simple, really simple. So, and again, to fix that, I'll send this on to you guys. Essentially, you put that regular expression in the box, which, which I've already written for you, against the request URI field, and that will just strip out all of those. So it's also worth saying, um, don't apply these to your main profile. So who, who here has a, a test view that they would they would apply stuff to? Thank you, good. Because that, that's one thing I should have said at the start. Don't just apply these to your account. Make sure they're applied to your test view because if you get them wrong, then obviously your data is kind of affected, affected forever. So, and again, luckily for you guys, PII also gets stripped out a lot of the time with that filter. So quite often emails, postcodes, um, which all count as PII, get captured. And you know that filter you just put on there will rip out th those as well. Because in this example, the kind of uh, query parameter is email, and that's someone's email address, which obviously you cannot collect in, in analytics generally. Um, and we've actually seen a number of accounts close down because of um, PII, because it's against Google Analytics terms and conditions. So it's very, very important. It's actually out of every single profile, including your raw one. You can't have it in your raw one either. So it's really important. And we've seen many high profile ones that have been, been taken away. So I guess there are three um, practical things that can be taken away. It's really important, the data hygiene bit. So on the advanced configuration side, nobody put their hand up to say that analytics is in, in the best shape possible or kind of all the kind of advanced things set up. So I guess today, before you take that away and think about it, I guess, you know, we look at ourselves and ask this question generally. So who here, I guess, thinks they know their customers? And I hope a bit more hands up here because surely you almost know some form of, you know, I guess mosaic or so hands up if you think you know your customers or at least your groups of customers. Okay, that's really good, right? So essentially, you want to take that knowledge you have and apply that to your analytics setup so it's more meaningful. Because if you don't do that, then it just becomes a, f a tool that is just collecting data, right? So, do you know your customers? Well, it's good that you guys said that, but in terms of how detail this needs to go, you don't need to go incredibly detailed to power personalization on your site. So this is a large uh, travel cook, travel, travel cook. This is a large travel client we work with, Thomas Cook, not travel cook. But if anyone steals that idea, I'm, I'm gonna be CEO of travel cook tomorrow. Um, you know, they essentially have three broad buckets of customers. You've got value seekers, i.e. the bucket and spade, you know, um, uh, children, holiday, kind of quite cheap, go once a year, etc. Trusted convenience, are people who are trying to book it the next day and kind of get out there, and then pure indulgence, ones who really just want, don't care about money and just want to focus on these things. So they're kind of three core buckets of, you know, things that you might want to set up. So obviously, you know, the kind of triggers on the site that they have are, you know, hotel, high to low, uh, pricing, the, the location they're going to, you know, how frequently they visit the site, whether they've got kids or not, all these kind of things that allow you to kind of start creating buckets of customers within your analytics account. So you can go really detailed though. Um, you know, this is for a pet client we work with. Uh, admittedly, John does look pretty good for 40, his age there, uh, only figurative obviously, but you know, you can see there, you want to understand your customers, obviously a dog, customer, dog owner does not want to see, you know, Jill's website because she has parrots or vice versa. If you've got a parrot and you're buying parrot food all the time, when you come to the site, you don't want to see 
you know, oh, hello, you know, here's a rabbit cage or whatever. You want to see a personalized website for you or at least some form of acknowledgement that you have bought products or you have a, a parrot or the right pet. So once you understand your customers, you can start to apply some of these more practical things in the account. So these have been around for quite a while, and I guess you might hear people talking about them generally, but they're really, really important. And these are part of GA3 or you know, Universal Analytics. You don't have to buy the enterprise version of Analytics to start capturing some of this stuff. Um, so more practical things are custom dimensions, which I'll talk about in a minute, full enhanced e-commerce setup. And what's really important is, is anyone here like a lead generation site? Okay, so you can use enhanced e-commerce for lead generation. So just because you're a lead generation site doesn't mean you can't not do enhanced e-commerce. So it's quite interesting some of the stuff we've done for a lot of our clients. So who knows what this is? I wish I had a prize to say there's a prize to give out. Who knows what this is? Okay, it's close. I'm thinking of a, a specific name for the, the thing you would put in to activate custom dimensions and uh, enhanced e-commerce. What's that? Script. Script, okay, close. Oh, ignore the format in again. Um, but this is called a, a data layer, which goes into your site. It's a piece of script which allows you to rip out all this great information on what customers do in your site. And, and again, as a percentage of customers we work with, I'd say less than 7% actually implement one of these properly or have one of these at all. And this is a really simple thing, you know, whether you use an agency or not, go to Google support section and you can essentially pretty much download a Google specific data layer. Um, and obviously kind of, you might have a bit of help to implement that, whether that's with an agency or your development team, but essentially having a data layer there for insight is step one in terms of getting the advanced insight. Because for an e-commerce site, this will allow you to grab out things like, have they sorted high to low? How, you know, what's the click-through rate for a certain type of products? Do, um, do customers who had red shoes abandon more than blue trousers or you know whatever your kind of products are? That's the fundamental step one for it. It's really, really simple to actually kind of do and start as a process generally. So, but getting this in allows you to kind of get more insight on your customers. So whatever they submit online or whatever kind of third party API stuff you can get in, it's a really interesting. So a lot of our clients, we look at kind of the gender they are, whether they've already submitted a lead or not, the products they've bought before, whether they've got a lead ID, logged in, logged out, what type of products they view, and then kind of branching out more into advanced things like plugging in weather, so like the location they are and the weather they see. We work for a kind of a, um, an outdoor company, if you want to call that, and essentially we, we push different types of products to them depending on the weather they're seeing right now in that specific location. Because even in the UK, you've obviously got kind of a Manchester weather, which is probably always raining. Maybe you don't need to do this for Manchester, but, uh, you know, it might be different kind of locations or, you know, plugging in weather from where they're going to, if they're kind of, you know, looking at festival uh, tents, etc. So quite interesting. But obviously each of these is bespoke for your business. I've given you kind of some ideas, some ideas there generally. But enhanced e-commerce, again, is kind of really, really important. And I guess the reason why I'm talking about setting all of these up, because you can use a lot of these to create your audiences um, and start to practically personalize the site with a new piece of, of kit that's just been released. Um, so it's really, really um, essential these are kind of put in. So enhanced e-commerce essentially allows you to look at things like which product caused the highest abandonment rate. So that on a lead generation site doesn't necessarily need to be a particular e-commerce product. So we work with Barrett Homes, which is a kind of house builder, and they want to understand abandonment rate by um, development. So what is a London development abandonment rate versus um, you know one in Manchester or kind of a Mayfair one versus one in you know locally here. Um, really kind of important and great insight. So who, who has enhanced e-commerce set up and working? Okay, that's really interesting. I, I thought there'd be a lot more. I thought it'd be kind of there because um, a lot of time we, we say, oh yeah, my enhanced e-commerce set up, but they just tick the button in the interface to say we want it. And then when you look at this report, nothing, nothing happens. So it's, uh, it's really good that's been set up, but obviously I would definitely start to look at this because this is kind of 18 months to two years kind of in, and your competitors will be doing this, um, you know, because it's really simple and very cost effective to get amazing insight. And obviously here you can understand things like all those custom dimensions you've set up here in terms of the products they looked at, you know, whether they're a customer or not, the kind of customer they are, you can then look at their performance in the checkout or performance through the site generally. Um, 
So it's really, really interesting. And especially when you guys are trying to sweat the most out of your acquisition. Because this is all about making your money go further, not about kind of, uh, yeah, anything else. And it's about retention as well a lot of the time. But there's a more kind of, um, again, an add-on for this. There's a, a lot of clients of ours see massive value in form field abandonment tracking. So understanding which field they left the website on, which field they went back to twice, how many seconds were spent in each field. And then what that means is, as a practical example, say they left on the phone number field, you know, you will know that as, as when they come back to the site and you could think of messaging around, we never sell your data or, you know, your, your, your phone number away from submitting your lead with us or whatever kind of thing fits in with your, with your customer. But having this kind of granular insight is really, really important because then you can start to tie that back to, oh, you know, they looked at X product, they abandoned on X field, they always come in at this time of day and start to build up that kind of a profile of your customers for personalization. So they're kind of three advanced things that are really practical. And I say they're totally free, out of the free version of analytics just require a bit of kind of configuration. So as far as activation goes, once all that is set up, which again can take a couple of months, two, three months, depending on the speed of the organization, activating that data is, is really, really important. Thinking about what you're going to do with it and why. People think personalization is a really scary word and oh, it's gonna require a team of loads of people, but just start really simple. Start honestly, really, really simple. Um, you need to understand what those top buckets of customers do. So forget trying to go crazy because underneath Thomas Cook's three core audiences, they obviously chop down by location, hotel type, you know, all these kind of crazy things, but they start right at the top in terms of giving the website experience and their media as well, the kind of really tailored uh, approach. So for example, if you're looking at really expensive hotel, you don't want to, you know, with, with this adult only, you don't want a website which is kid friendly or whatever, a, a, a hotel that's kid friendly. So, um, so personalization of, of your website, like I say, you know, we want to get to a point where you're not just John or Jill going onto a site, which is one website for all. And the thing is, personalization isn't for everybody. If you have such a high proportion of new sessions that only come to your site once, then personalization isn't for you. Personalization is for those sites where it's returning customers, it's repeat business, and it's fiercely competitive. So like high-end fashion or gambling sites are probably the two that have to do it because the competition is so fierce. So if you're a one-time only visit and the client only submits a lead once, then personalization isn't for you. There's no point in thinking about it. Um, generally speaking. But the idea again is that we give John or Jill their kind of personalized experience. And obviously, hopefully the pre-bit of this, the analytics part, is going to fuel that kind of information. So from an activ activation point of view, this might like a, a slight sales pitch for Google's stuff, but they've recently released a product around three or four months ago, which levels the playing field for a lot of kind of small to medium businesses. So Historically, personalization has been activated by the likes of Qubit, Monetate, you know, Maximize, are very expensive tools. And we're, we're affiliated with those and we use those, but a lot of our clients have been adapt, adopting to this because all their data is in GA. Then you can link GA with this new tool, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second. So back to my point earlier, segments of one don't exist, um, especially kind of, you know, level of organizations that I guess we all work for. You know, the Amazons that might exist, they might get that granular, but you don't need to think about segments of one. I'd think about it as buckets, and that's the kind of approach we go with buckets of customers. Even really simple, simple. This is the kind of hotel uh, chain we work with. We, we kind of look at the gender of them, the lifetime value, leisure versus business customers, and then kind of the type of product they've been added to the basket around location, and then if they're registered or not. They're the kind of four kind of buckets, really simple to work with. Um, and each one of those obviously wants a different experience. You know, the registered users probably want to be recognized around, you know, how many times they've stayed, how many points they've got, whereas kind of your, you know, your leisure traveler might not do that, only come to your site once. So um, does anyone have any examples? So a few people put their hands up about, you know, we already have these segments. Who would have an example of, say, three or four core buckets of their customers that they, they would like to share? Mm -hmm. be more resilient in crisis. And so within our first day training courses, we kind of have three groups of customers. And most of our bread and butter is workplace first day training because you're legally required to have it in, in your workplace depending on your risk level. 
So we have accountants with us who are generally um, small to medium sized enterprises. We have key accounts who are big businesses that spend over a certain amount with us each year. Um, and we also have uh, public courses for people who want to learn first aid in their everyday life without like, legal requirements to mm -hmm. do so. Um, and the online experience is slightly different for each of those customers as they go through the checkout process. Mm -hmm. We have them defined um, in different funnels and buckets of analytics so that we can kind of understand where some of the pain points are in that process. Great, that's good. But I don't know if you kind of have a view on, you know, especially the big corporate ones, if they return the amount of value in saying, you know, welcome back, you know, you were at this point in the journey, blah, 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 and kind of see if that would increase engagement. Um, yeah, they have, um, we have like a login-based portal for those mm -hmm. big customers that's actually tailored to them. They have special kind of pricing and discounts. Okay. So when they return to the site, they actually log in um, as a requirement to get those discounted prices. So okay. All the additional kind of login based behavior as well. Great, and that's really good. I guess that you're you're looking at that and kind of um, changing the website, kind of looking at that experience. But obviously, that's I guess been built out by a website development team, and it's. Uh, not nimble, well, I didn't say it's like a lot of clients we, we talk to personalization to say oh, our website development team aren't nimble, they kind of they've got a lot in, in backlog or whatever. Um yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing that. So from from a segmentation point of view, and again ignore the format in here, but all the data you have on all of your kind of audiences and customers, you're already there. You can obviously create audiences or segments of customers and then look at their behavior online. So you know, we found that the launch of a tool called Optimize 360 has leveled the playing field for a lot of kind of small to medium sized enterprise, uh, small to medium businesses compete with the big boys who can afford massive tool costs. So something like Cubit might cost you eight to 30,000 a month, depending on, you know, the size and scale of your business, whereas Optimize 360 is like 1,200 pounds a month. And you see there's quite a big difference in terms of actually activating personalization. And I guess it gets around using a development um, agency or internal dev resource for activating some really basic personalization so it's quite an interesting tool and like i say i in no ways i prospect just affiliated to optimize 360 i'm keen to say that because we obviously work with all the major tools as well but we're we're using it because it is leveling the playing field and a lot of our clients personalization is now affordable i guess in terms of a actual activation point of view which is really good obviously a lot of our clients use ga ga360 having all that data there allows you to plug into this tool and use it straight away. So it's really, really interesting. And it allows you to change the website without going through like a, a dev um, change, a dev request, and allows you to start kind of experimenting in that way. So it's kind of a simple example that the kind of travel client we work with, um, is Jory's in, so kind of a, you know, 35 locations across the UK. And what they have is they have, you know, a bucket of customers who is, uh, Focus around international, so about 35% you know, of their business from international bookers coming from Europe, coming from all these kind of different places at, uh, in America, etc. And what we're able to do is create these audiences in analytics, you know, look at things like Spanish traffic, visited the site before, they've already got a price. So when they come back to the site, they don't probably don't want to see that kind of experience because you know the hotel they're staying at, you know the price, you know the kind of duration of their stay. So what we kind of trial with Optimize 360 is putting a message up there, which you can't see very well, but essentially it says in Spanish, over 3,000 people from Spain book with us each month that Jory's in. So it kind of gives them that confirmation that other Spanish nationals, um, and we have the same with like Americas and other kind of things, and obviously the kind of personalization is really simple, and it also like um, pre-populated their hotel that they searched for previously, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the engagement between analytics and Optimize 360 was actually really good because it kind of linked seamlessly rather than you kind of taking out and putting into Qubit or kind of a different type of tool. So it's actually quite interesting. And yeah, results-wise, you know, obviously everyone would expect this, but kind of reduction in bounce rate, improvement in conversion rate, and a plus 5% uh, in AOV. Um, and obviously through the tool, it's kind of run permanently, so it needs to be kind of coded out. So it's quite an interesting, um, interesting bit, bit of technology that, that we've got here. So. I guess making a personalization a reality, so there's kind of three core bits. Get the data right, including data hygiene and all the advanced stuff. Um, and I'd do that straight away, because like I say, it's free, really cost effective versus kind of marketing spend as well. Walk before you can run, don't get crazy with your segments or audiences, just do two, three really simple um, audiences. And then also start to think about, once that's done, the media journey of those customers. Because again, from a 
uh, you know, a Google Analytics point of view, you can plug audiences into you know, your bidding platforms to tailor the messaging. So the display advert the customer sees, the PPC advert the customer sees, and then obviously the website they then see. All of it kind of links together. So once you've got those basic bits of personalization, think about the communication across different touch points. So uh, in the Thomas Cook example, rather than showing them a generic Thomas Cook ad, we would show them a display advert that was specific for, for the pure indulgence audience, a luxury hotel or kind of treat yourself, indulge yourself. And then when you got back to the site, you then show them a consistent message around indulgence, high quality. And obviously that kind of really improves engagement of um, retention and also lowers media costs and acquisition costs, generally speaking. So. Um, that's the end thank you so much for listening and hopefully that was practical and also a bit kind of strategy stuff so uh, thanks. thank you Dan a lot of information and tips to take in has anyone got any burning questions for Dan they want to ask I'm good um, I'm not sure if it's something you could help with or not. Um, it's around um, traffic, where it comes from, so like our acquisition traffic. Yeah. Um, we like obviously monitor that every day, and especially org organic. So organic would have typically been maybe like say 97% of our traffic. Okay. You know, with little bits and bobs coming from somewhere else. But recently, um, our indeed traffic, we're a recruitment business, obviously, um, has become organic traffic. Do you have any idea why why Google has done that? Why it's changed it from referral traffic to organic? So again, a, a lot of the things we see are, are naming conventions of traffic sources, and Google kind of obviously does its own thing, does whatever it wants to do in terms of categorization, whatever it suits them in their, um, you know, because they control the interface, they can do whatever they like, but you know, monitoring those things. But you can rewrite the traffic source if you want to, to put it in something else that is more meaningful for your business. It's just done in the same way that filter will be done. So if you notice it's gone to a um, organic or change, you can obviously rewrite it back to how you wanted it to be. Because um, there's loads of occasions where they they, they change how the way how the stuff is categorized. But because even things like social, like Facebook, is badges referral as standard. So obviously we put filters on there to rewrite those back into social. So um, but if it, I mean, if you give me access to the account, I can take a look. I can help. Was there, was there another question? Was there yeah, I was just wondering um, what kind of heat mapping tools, like the the, na the name of it, whichever one you use or whichever one you think is the best. Yep. So it depends what you want to do, but Hotjar is like the best thing that's happened to optimization generally. It's like $8 a month, like really, really cheap, and it gives you the same enterprise functionality as Session Cam, Crazy Egg, you know, Mouse Flow, et cetera, and it's absolutely destroying right, the market, really. Um, so Hotjar is, is the one. There are other ones that are interesting, but it, Hotjar is just so good. And again, I have no way I'm affiliated to Hotjar. It's just so good. I, I'm keen to say that because obviously kind of sometimes a lot of sales stuff going on these things, but really, really cheap and absolutely amazing. Some of our clients pay two, 3000 a month for Session Cam, and obviously we give them hot jar for free and it's like, you know, session camera really, really find it hard. No one's here from session camera, are they? <laughs> so, and so one more question. Any, oh, sorry, no. It was just whether you had any decent resources for learning more about Google Tag Manager. Okay. Um, Google have a training, um, that's a training module, but if you go to... If you Google you know, Google Tag Manager, how to use Google Tag Manager, there is tons of resources on Google Support, its own website, and a lot of the uh, the articles have like little, um, you know, called like a little university hat. So if you don't want to read the stuff about how stuff works, you just press it, press the little hat, and it comes down with a video. Press play, and you can watch a video about the stuff, which makes it really simple and easy to understand. But um, there's no formal qualification in GTM. Yet, yeah, apart from agency one, so um, but go to the Google support um, section, there's tons of stuff about how everything works. So, um, and that's the thing about this analytics isn't really that complicated, honestly. It's not a lot of the things that I talk about. If you just kind of take a minute out of your day to read some stuff, you can do a lot of these things yourself, you know, rather than using agencies a lot of the time. So, honestly, it, it, you do it's really simple a lot, a lot of the time. One last one. Hi. Uh, it's just going back to what you were saying before about rewriting filters so you mm -hmm. can get the Facebook track it, track it yeah. back into social. Is there a way of using filters to track dark social? So if anyone sent links via like Messenger apps or anything like that? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, 
but I can't give you all the answers. <laughs> you have to pay an agency sometimes to get this stuff, but <laughs> it's, it's the same with apps and stuff like that. It's, uh, there's ways around it, but it's not standard scripts out of the box stuff. Um, but yeah, ultimately, yes. Whatever, I guess, that's why it's really, my job's really interesting because every, every setup is very different in terms of what is fake or what's wrong in clients' accounts. And a lot of the time it is a bespoke um, piece of script or a bespoke implementation. So, um, but in short, yes. Um, as long as it's, a, yeah, as long as it's available to differentiate in your, in your account, it's really easy to filter to whatever you want to call it. Okay, another round of applause for Dan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh,